So greetings everyone and uh, welcome to the March conference. I am Marjorie Rollins. I am the executive director for LOINC and the newest member of this amazing uh, LOINC team. And on behalf of all of us and the Regan Street Institute, I am very pleased that so many of you are joining us today from far and wide here in the US and uh, across the globe. Our conference uh, is virtual again today because the pandemic demands it. And, um, but the silver lining is that because the conference is virtual, it is more accessible and available to more of you. We have over 198 participants from 24 countries, which is just um, awesome. And for the next few days, we promise a program that is replete with thoughtful, useful, and engaging content. This is our schedule at a glance uh, for the week. Today, we have our Clem McDonald keynote lecture, committee meetings and workshops, which are open to everyone. If you have registered for the conference sessions, which are Wednesday and Thursday, we have dual tracks of programming. Feel free to mix and match. Um, you'll not want to miss the LOINC campfire on Thursday, which we promise will be informative, interactive, and fun. And on Friday, we have more committee meetings and you'll want to hear the update from ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, and hear all about the good work that is happening there. I do want to take a moment and uh, set the stage for our conference and acknowledge the exceptional times and the exceptional action that we've all been called to. I don't think any one of us could have imagined our collective resilience and the incredible growth that we have all seen in our work this past year. Um, there has been a heightened focus on novel and or improved technologies, including AI, big data, 5G, telehealth, and HIE. And of course, all of the terminology and data standards work of the SDOs, government agencies, and other healthcare organizations, which we will hear about um, throughout the conference this week. And on that note, I'd like to welcome Dr. Peter Emby, President and CEO of the Regan Street Institute. Um, Dr. Emby will give us a few remarks and then introduce Dr. Mickey Tripathi, National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, who we are just thrilled to have with us today. Uh, Dr. Emby will moderate a conversation with Dr. Tripathi, and that will serve as the Clem McDonald keynote uh, lecture. So Dr. Envy, over to you. Thank you so much, Marjorie. And uh, everyone, um, welcome to the LOIN conference. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to see all of you here and uh, um, particularly to welcome uh, Dr. Tripathi uh, as our keynote lecturer today. Uh, I just wanna first echo um, Dr. Rollins' comments. Um, this is a really exceptional time and, and a really important one. And uh, the work of the Loin community uh, has always been critically important and it couldn't be more important. Um, so with that, I, I'd uh, love to just take a moment to uh, introduce uh, Mickey. Uh, Dr. Tripathi uh, is the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at uh, Health and Human Services, where he leads the formulation of federal health IT strategy and coordinates federal health IT policy standards, programs, and investments. Uh, Mickey has over 20 years of experience in the health IT landscape. He most recently served as the Chief Alliance Officer for Arcadia, a healthcare data and software company focused on population health management and value-based care, and um, the project manager for the Argonaut Project, the industry collaboration to accelerate the adoption of FHIR, uh, and as a board member of HL7, the Sequoia Project, 
the Commonwealth Health Alliance and the Karen Alliance, to name a few. Um, perhaps most uh, uh, importantly to us, uh, Mickey got his, uh, I, I don't know if it was his start, but early on in his career at any way, he was the founding president and CEO of the Indiana Health Information Exchange uh, right here in Indianapolis. And uh, uh, that's certainly what we consider to be one of the hi highlights of his career. I hope he does too. Um, and uh, since then, of course, he's continued to do incredible work. He served as the president and CEO of the Massachusetts eHealth Collaborative, uh, nonprofit health IT advisory and, and clinical data analytics company, um, and uh, has served in numerous other roles, including as a, a fellow of the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. He holds a PhD in political science from MIT and a master of public health from Harvard University uh, and a bachelor's degree in political science from Vassar. And prior to receiving his PhD, he was a presidential management fellow and senior operations research analyst at the office of the Secretary of Defense in Washington, DC, where he received the Secretary of Defense Meritorious Civilian Service Medal. So Mickey, thank you so much for uh, taking the time um, to join us. and and for taking uh, the time at this point in your career to uh, take on the, the role of service as our director of ONC. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really excited. Well, I'm really excited to, um, uh, to, uh, to take on this role and specifically really excited to be here this morning. And you know, as an indication of that, I took off my hoodie and put on a sweater <laughs> And I have my fancy background too. Um, there you go. <laughs> you got you got it all set. That's fantastic. I don't do that for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. So, like Marjorie said, we're going to be doing this as a conversation. So um, I imagine um, they'll put us side by side here, so people can see us talking to each other. But I'm just going to jump in because uh, I know we don't have too much of your time, but I, we have a number of questions that people have uh, put together here for us, and some others that I may. Uh, come up with as we talk. And I so I wanted to start by acknowledging this is such an exciting and important time for, for health IT and, and for informatics and, and our nation. Obviously, we're going through so much. Um, and, and there's so much promise that we all uh, have already realized, but so much more that we can realize with health IT. So I wanted to start by asking you, you what drew you to the role at this moment in time? And, and what are your initial thoughts anyway around goals and milestones that you envision as being important for ONC as you get started? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, well, first and foremost, in terms of, you know, what, what, what uh, made the role attractive um, is, you know, a number of things. I mean, I've been, I was a federal employee, as you noted, in, a, in, a, in an earlier life. I'm old, so I've had a few careers. <laughs> um, and, you uh, um, and even though I didn't work in healthcare at the time, I, you know, I was, I was working, you know, um, specifically on weapon systems programs and, you know, really didn't work in the healthcare side of, of DOD or the Air Force where I was working. Um, just, you know, the call to federal service, I just, you know, I remembered back then and it's been, you know, sort of refreshed now that, you know, there is something distinctly different about, you know, doing, directly doing the work of the people. Um, and that's, you know, I remember that being inspiring and this was a great opportunity that came up. I think also, you know, being able to um, come in and assist at such an important time in our country, uh, with our country where I think government has a very unique role, you know, sort of, uh, you know, if you think about the recent history of our country, you know, one could arguably say that, you know, that, that the federal government and particularly Department of Health and Human Services is, you know, sort of got a momentous role to play um, you know, sort of historically, um, and that seemed like a, you know, a great opportunity that I wanted to do whatever I could to contribute. Um, and, and, then, and then finally, I think is, you know, I've been, even though I've, you know, had multiple careers because I'm old, I've been in health IT for a while as well, um, 20 years, as you noted. And it, you know, it just feels like it's a you know, great time to be able to, you know, we all spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, $40 billion in federal subsidies to lay the foundation of what everyone wanted and now having the opportunity to say, now what are we gonna do with that? How do we leverage that to be able to achieve the outcomes that we've wanted? And you know, we've seen some disappointments, um, but we've also seen, I think, a tremendous amount of prog progress that none of us would have envisioned 15 years ago. So you know, the opportunity to play somewhat of a, you know, of a central role in that just uh, you know, was, uh, was really exciting. Yeah, that's great. And, and again, I, I, 
I really sincerely mean it when I thank you for your service because that is really such an incredible um, um, job and, and in, an important role. I can remember a time when uh, ONC didn't exist because uh, I'm old also. So uh, <laughs> so this is great. Um, well, actually, you, you, you sort of teed up the next question for me. There, the, the foundation, as you point out, has been a, a strong foundation has been laid. And I, you know, I would agree with you. I think there's certainly been you know, less uh, achieved than all of us had dreamed at the very beginning of all this, but a lot has been achieved and we certainly have a long way to go. Um, you know, one of the visions early on for the, the kind of interoperability roadmap and, and what we expected to happen and, and, and still uh, are starting to see the, the signs of now um, is really the ability to uh, enable the exchange of information in order to really create a true learning health system. Uh, as we begin to interconnect and, and interoperate more freely. Um, more specifically, interoperability is expected to sort of facilitate ubiquitous access to data for a number of different stakeholders um, and, and really dramatically reduce the time from the translation of sort of uh, real world data to evidence to, to practice and, and benefit for people and populations. Can you say a bit about how you see ONC's role and, and more generally what we all need to be doing in health IT to really advance that vision of a learning health system? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, a, a few things. I think one is just, you know, being the consummate, um, never, never ending advocate for greater interoperability across the entire ecosystem. Um, and, you know, that should go without saying, but I think, you know, being that, you know, that, that sort of advocate and being able to articulate that in ways that um, that's understandable and meaningful across the, you know, healthcare value chain, I think is, you know, sort of one fundamental aspect of what we do. But, you know, going down now one level, um, it's, you know, um, orchestrating all the various levers that are available on the private side, as well as the public side, and, you know, being able to uh, you know, sort of figure out what is that orchestration of all those levers to help to move the system forward. Because I think, you know, one of the, you know, the biggest challenges we have in healthcare, and it's not just with interoperability, and I'm arguably one could point to, you know, sort of every issue that the U.S. has with the healthcare system is that it's not a healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, it's the extreme fragmentation of, you know, of healthcare by jurisdiction, by business, I mean, you name it, every single dimension is fragmented in a way that's unique to healthcare in a way um, compared to other parts of the, of the US economy, at least. So I think, you know, ONC plays, you know, sort of a critical role in, um, in a, you know, and, and, and really one of our most valuable roles, I think, in identifying where are those gaps um, and what is the sort of the unique orchestration of levers that are required to move the ball forward? Because in some areas, you know, we have regulations, we have regulatory authority derives from statute. You're able to, you know, sort of pull some of those levers in a way that's judicious, that doesn't stifle innovation, all of that. But in other areas, we don't have those kinds of strong levers or those kinds of strong authorities, um, or those authorities rest with other federal agencies, CMS, CDC, FDA. And it's, you know, figuring out how do we use, you know, sort of a, a, um, an orchestrated way of bringing together the soft and the hard levers to achieve a set of goals that are going to work both, you know, for providers, for patients, um, and for, um, you know, for all other healthcare um, uh, stakeholders. So I think, you know, to me, that's really the ultimate trick um, that, that ONC pulls, <laughs> and I think does fairly successfully, um, but it's an ongoing challenge because, you know, all those pieces are all moving parts. And so figuring out, all right, now the market has changed. Now we have apps, now we have fire, um, now we have this regulation, now we have information blocking, now we have a pandemic. Um, <laughs> how do we, you know, or how, yeah. how are we sort of continuously adjusting to say, all right, how can we, you know, sort of orchestrate these levers to move things forward um, in, in some of these key areas? Um, and I think that's, you know, that, that's sort of an important part of it. The other, the other part that I would um, uh, just, you know, sort of going back to your question about the learning healthcare system, yeah. I think, you know, continuously sort of raising the bar in a, you know, in a meaningful, but, you know, but practical way, um, uh, you know, in terms of the kinds of functionality that's available. And I think we've, if we've learned nothing else from, you know, our entire experience with implementing electronic health records um, is that, um, is that just putting the technology in place doesn't magically make all of this happen, right? That it's got to be, you know, sort of, uh, a real motivation at a very deep level. And, and so we move through meaningful use, we move through a whole bunch of things with the expectation that 
okay, a learning health system will just emerge from that because all the players are going to want to do that and everyone will you know, sort of um, be focused and orchestrated for that. And then what we found was that, um, you know, that, that people did what they needed to do to just satisfy those specific requirements, right? And so every one of those became a very specific line item with an eye toward how do I minimally do what I need to do in order to, <laughs> in order to you know, um, uh, meet this objective or get this incentive. And you know, some of that's understandable, um, you know, it's because everyone's got priorities. And again, we've got fragmentation of the system. So everyone's got a different set of motivations depending on where you are in the value chain, where you are geographically. Um, but you know, I think one of the things we saw then is that, you know, the, that the collection of all of those individual things still doesn't get us to a learning health system, right? Um, and so, you know, I think part of what 21st Century Cures did was step back and say, we need to have a fundamental rethinking of you know, kind of the paradigm here. Um, you know, almost in a way, I think of it as almost in a way that HIPAA kind of changed the way that we were going to think about, you know, sort of um, interoperability. And, and, you know, HIPAA is not perfect by any means, but I think all of us would acknowledge there was a pre-HIPAA world and a post-HIPAA world. Yeah. Um, and those worlds were very different. And I think in some ways we're going to think of a pre-information blocking world and a post-information blocking world because um, the you know the changes that are you know that are um, baked into statute and are, are strongly encouraged, if not required, are the deep deeper cultural changes and the attitudes that organizations have toward the way they think about information sharing um, are going to have to be fundamental to the way you know to the way we move forward. And I think that gets us the basis um, you know for uh, you know what we might think of as a as a learning health system. Although I think you know the last thing I would point out is. I think we need to better define what a learning health system means uh, because again, you know, it's such a high level concept with an idea that, you know, that, that all of these systems will immediately serve up the information for every single use case for every single possibility um, for learning. And I think, you know, again, another thing I think that, you know, that uh, hopefully we've all learned is that um, all of this is about use cases until you're able to sharply focus on what is it you want to accomplish? What's the data that we need to be able to support that? What's the, you know, sort of the, the workflow um, to both get that data as well as make that data available on the other end? Um, if all of that isn't thought through in an end-to-end -end way, it, it's just not going to magically happen. Um, yeah. So I think that we, you know, owe ourselves, uh, you know, sort of uh, more thought into what we mean by learning health system in order to move that forward. Yeah, absolutely. That's very well said. I. I think you're exactly right. I mean, the, the idea that sort of magically, uh, even if we did have ones and zeros flowing, we suddenly were going to start to use those in a different way requires a rethink of everything from not only the technical capabilities, but the incentives and make sure they're aligned and all the different things that actually drive the way it is that people behave. So, um, and, you know, enables them to do that in a way that also, you know, avoids burnout and all the other things that we're trying to do. Um, it, it's such a complex environment. And thankfully, you understand it very well. So uh, that's that's a great answer. So you know, maybe picking up on that, and you, you spoke about 21st century cures, and and it's, it is such a critical legislation, and we have such high hopes. Um, a lot of a lot of what we've seen, and, and frankly, COVID 19, it, it, you know, has certainly uh, the pandemic uh, has has demonstrated, it, it, among many things, um, how critically important telemedicine and virtual care are going to be, and we, we see a lot of movement there. Um, I know that there was a, you know, envisioned in, in the 21st Century Cures Act, this, you know, a, a ability to really open uh, information and data access um, more broadly and being able to enable these kinds of, of approaches, including virtual care. Uh, and again, if we've seen anything, it's that a lot of what many have been talking about for some time has really been accelerated. Um, I think as we, as we start to look forward, uh, we know that um, a lot of the kinds of, of standards and capabilities that we expect to enable that kind of work, like FIRE, as you mentioned, um, are, are important, but really not quite there in terms of, of full uh, ability to effectively execute in the real world. So as you think about what we need uh, now during the pandemic, but certainly as we move forward, uh, how are you thinking about as you say, if we come down a level, how are you thinking about enabling or, or do it? What, what ONC can do to enable and address the needs and challenges that still face us in that area of, of data and technology standards uh, like FIRE? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, let me get back to you in a year. Um, no, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think there, you know, there's a couple of things at play already, which is respect to, with, with respect to 
um, you know, getting information blocking finally in place after, you know, after four or five years since the passage of 21st century cures, just so we can get that behind us and underway. I mean, I think that's, you know, and, and, um, and then the, e the corresponding EHR certification rule as well, um, you know, as much what's, what's really interesting um, and uh, is that, you know, if you look at the market um, and all of the enthusiasm around fire, um, there is still not a regulation that requires use of fire, right? I mean, the yeah. certification rule as it stands right now does not require a fire, right. you know, capability. That's all, you know, go, goes into effect, you know, in, in two years from now. Or the rule says that, you know, to be clear, right. the rule says that, you know, you are required to do it, but it doesn't go into effect for another two years or something like that, or 18 months um, after, you know, after those delays. Yet, we've seen, you know, enormous enthusiasm um, and implementation of fire, although lots of different variants of it already, right? Um, so, you know, so I think that's, you know, that's one of the challenges. So. As we think about you know sort of that moving forward, I, mean, I think it's really important for us to you know to to pull as many levers as we can to both you know meet the dates, but also I'd like to do whatever I can to you know sort of uh, encourage industry adoption before those dates come into effect, so that everyone isn't waiting till the last minute. And I know you know everyone's got priorities, and and that's always the challenge. And you know I've worked a lot with you know with technology vendors as well as um, with provider organizations, so you know I fully understand that. It's always a question of priority. It's not a question of, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to do these things or I don't see the value of these things for society. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a little bit of a challenge. But, um, you know, again, using our soft and hard levers on this um, to be able to at least, you know, at a minimum um, support and encourage, uh, you know, sort of the timelines that are there and then do whatever we can to, you know, sort of bring those in using, you know, using soft levers at a, at a minimum. I think that, you know, also we need to you know, sort of appreciate the different kinds of things that we can do. And I think ONC has been um, pretty savvy in, in putting together, uh, you know, kind of a uh, portfolio of soft and hard levers that can help to move the industry, give the industry direction about where, you know, where we want to head um, that are, you know, some of which is sub-regulatory. So it gives a little bit of flexibility um, because, you know, one of the challenges always is that, you know, regulations are by design you know, not things that, you know, that are just, you know, ad hoc wins, right? There's a whole process for regulations and in a technology space, that's always a challenge. How do you, you know, sort of use regulations in a way to motivate industry without, um, without inhibiting industry? Um, and so I think that, you know, when you think of, of the things like the standards value, you know, the standards advancement process that ONC has, the US CDI and being able to give, you know, sort of visibility um, uh, to what are the kinds of things that we want to be able to have more structured um, as a, you know, as, as sort of a roadmap for, you know, for the industry to be working toward um, with an eye toward, you know, some set, sub subset of those eventually being baked into regulation, you start to have the ability to signal to industry the kinds of things that, um, you know, that, that uh, in terms of directionality and pace that, you know, that we'd like to see. So, um, you know, so there's, I think that set of things related to both the regulatory as well as the sub-regulatory that, um, you know, that help us uh, help move us forward. And then, you know, so, and then some key focus areas. I mean, that, you know, in public health in particular, for example, due to the pandemic, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of resource, a tremendous amount of, you know, sort of policy resources, as well as financial resources that are, that are being um, brought to bear. And, um, you know, and because of, you know, sort of the, the, um, the spotlight that's been shown on the weaknesses of the system, I think, you know, more attention now being paid to that. So I think that'll be, you know, both a challenge because, you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic. And so we want to figure out how do we do what we can to solve the immediate problem. Um, but also, how do we do that with an eye toward investments, toward the, you know, the kind of infrastructure that I think all of us appreciate that we need, but, you know, we've underfunded um, and under motivated for, you know, for, for too long. So we're doing a, a bunch of work with um, various of the executive order work groups. Um, as many of you know, may know, there have been a flurry of executive orders that have, that have come out um, from the administration, all of which are fantastic. Um, each of which, you know, one that I'm on the inside, recognize that, oh, every one of those executive orders actually has work attached to it. <laughs> like someone, someone actually has to do that. Right. <laughs> it's not just a declaration that just happens. And so- Really? They don't just write it and then- Yeah, I know, happen. you would think it's just, they're self-implementing, right? It's like a learning healthcare system. <laughs> yeah, come on. Right. Um, so anyway, there's a number of them that we're you know, specifically working on, um, some of them related to equity and another one that um, is gonna be a significant um, amount of work, I think, and effort for us with, um, with the CDC 
which is a, um, we're co-eating with the CDC um, an evaluation of the public health data system. You may recall one of the Fantastic. orders yeah. had a data-driven, I forget, it, ensuring a data-driven response to public health emergencies or something like that was the name of it. So there's one that focuses on interoperability of public health data systems. And so we in the code and the, the CDC are collaboratively co-leading that. Um, and we just launched it, but you know that'll be, um, you know, I think a pretty significant um, you know, um, uh, opportunity for us to take a real look at where are the gaps, what have, what have we discovered now about you know, where those gaps are? How can we think about near-term mitigations to close some of those gaps? But more importantly, how do we think about the public health ecosystem you know, in the future? Because I think one of the challenges that we've all had with public health in particular is that we tend to think of public health, and I think this is certainly a little bit within the government. I think it's a US thing as well, that we think of public health as those assets that are owned by the CDC and state and local health um, you know, public health agencies for registries and you know required reporting. And that's that's what we think of public health without a more expansive view of, wait a minute, this is an ecosystem. This is a complete ecosystem. It's a clinical care ecosystem. There's a payment ecosystem. And all of that is part of a public health ecosystem. And how do we sort of embrace that broader vision to you know think about the public health system of the future? That's great. Um, I'm just taking some notes. This is this is fantastic. So um, that makes a lot of sense. I think you 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 touched on something there that I that I also wanted to talk about. Um, I'm going to come back to disparities in a moment because I do want to talk about that. But picking up again on the public health component, um, there's a lot that's been put in place. I certainly know that we have um, benefited from this here in Indiana in the sense that. Um, it's been remarkable. I think we've all seen this. It's been remarkable how people have come together during the pandemic and gotten bureaucracy out of the way, um, been able to sort of enable um, activities and data flows and, and uh, capabilities that otherwise would have taken months or years. And we were able to do it in days and weeks because we had to, because we had a pandemic, we needed to address that. And um, you know, I think because of a lot of the infrastructure and capabilities and relationships that we have here in Indiana, as you know, through uh, the HIE and Regan Street and otherwise uh, with the, our collaborators across the health systems and the states, it's really been great. My, one of my concerns is that when these executive orders end and, and, and sort of things go back to the, the way they were regu from a regulatory perspective, we will have lost some of the capabilities that we, that we now had to put in place um, and some of them should go away. They were very specific for the pandemic and others probably shouldn't because they've actually enabled some improvements. And so we're trying to sort of think about that um, deliberately here with our colleagues at the, at the State House. I wonder how you're thinking about that sort of thing um, at the level of, of these agents, interagency discussions. Can you say a bit about that? Yeah, I, I think it is a completely valid concern. <laughs> uh, you know, Bo, uh, I, I think that, um, both from a you know from a policy perspective that to your point we you know will suspend things and then it's like all right well back to business as usual um, you know as soon as the, and you know a part of that is very practical in the sense that um, you know there are certain things to the extent that there are waving of wands some of that ends up you know the ability to wave that wand um, without getting bogged down and you know lawsuits or you know whatever it could be um, has to do with tying it to the emergency right that you say well because we have declared a pandemic emergency and now that extends to the next year, now we are doing this set of things. And so some of those things will sort of automatically, you know, go back, revert back to, you know, the pre-emergency, um, you know, sort of status. And so there's a little bit of that challenge that you do it for practicality, um, but that means that, you know, without an eye toward the continuity of it, you would actually have to take proactive action to make sure that they, you know, they extend into the future. So, you know, building in somewhere in our process the ability to say from a policy perspective, what are those things that we want to you know, start to work on to, you know, to, to lay a foundation to extend those? Um, and of course, in the middle of a pandemic, people tend not to focus specifically on those things. And also the government is a million headed beast. And so <laughs> figuring out you know, what are all of those various things that every agency has, it's OCR and it's OIG and it's CMS and it's CDC and some of it's local, some of it's federal, you know, that, I, mean, I think that that's a dedicated effort. Um, and, you know, ONC will certainly try to play a role in that, because um, that's a lot of what we do. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, but it's going to take, you know, a, a, a big effort and a big policy push there, I think, you know, for sure. I guess the, you know, the other thing that, um, the other challenge I think that's related to that is, you know, because of the, um, because of the pandemic, um, 
that has um, understandably led to a lot of money um, being pumped through the system, which is, you know, which is, is natural <laughs> and is the right thing to do because we need to do whatever we can as a, as a country to get past it. Um, it has also led to very short cycle and in many cases, localized decision making, which again is very often the, the absolutely right thing to do, right? I mean, you, we can't be standing in the way of people's ability to, to, to deliver. On right. the other hand, a consequence of that is that a lot of that money just gets plowed through the existing ways of doing business. And now what you now what we've done is further laid the foundation for the existing ways of doing business. Right? Right. And so now it's like, well, great. Now I've had, you know, another tens or hundreds of millions literally go in and reinforce the very things that we are trying to uh, address because those things led to the gaps that we're trying to, you know, sort of manage right now. And so you have yeah. a lot of short-term band-aid kind of things that I think are, are natural. And, you know, this isn't a, this isn't a policy, um, you know, sort of criticism. This is just a, a reality of, you know, what, what happens in a crisis and, you know, kinds of things that happen. So I think, you know, a lot of what, you know, I think we're hoping to do with this work group, but also um, raise, you know, sort of more awareness of, and certainly ONC is trying to do this in all of our um, uh, agency to agency discussions and raising it with the secretariat is, you know, how do we start to bake in now consideration of, investments that are going to serve us well in the future um, that don't short you know shortcut um, or undercut the ability to do the things we want to do today but have a link to the future that says this is the way this is the directionally where we want to head and we're not you know sort of further you know congealing the things that we actually wanted to get rid of <laughs> right um, right and so you know i think there's a lot there's a lot to do there you know and again it's going to be more than just onc can do but you know a lot of what i'm focusing on um, as a priority area that I didn't fully appreciate when I was outside of ONC, even though I'd worked very closely at ONC, but now I'm on the inside, is the importance of that um, inter, you know, within the federal government coordination that ONC does, which is a, you know, a part of, you know, a part That's of That's really great. That's really great to hear because I, I, I assumed that was happening a lot more than I saw, and I'm glad to hear that it is happening. Um, the, uh, one one other quick comment that that occurs to me as you're saying all of this is it, it reminded me to some extent and it's not the same because it wasn't deliberate but of the beacon program um you know the idea that there are all of these sort of local experiments happening and you know there could very well be something very valuable to learn from those even as there are probably a lot of those local things that are quite local and and to your point probably shouldn't be congealed in place um, but, uh, you know, it could very well be that in addition to the interagency things at the federal level, that there's benefits to be gained from the experiments that have happened at the state uh, level. And, um, you know, certainly organizations like ours would be more than happy to, to help and contribute to that. Let me, let me make, I know we're coming uh, toward the end of your time, and, and I know it's very valuable and I appreciate it. So I, I wanted to maybe turn it and end with a couple of quick questions. Uh, one of them very important, which is really around the issue of, of health disparities and health equity and how much uh, we, you know, it was always an issue. It was an issue before the pandemic. It's certainly been heightened uh, because of the pandemic and we're all um, increasingly aware of it. Um, ONC has been leading the way in terms of a lot of uh, uh, the interoperability cap capabilities, particularly around social determinants of health. And that's gonna be increasingly important. We're certainly very focused on that at, at Loink and Regan Street. Um, and I'm wondering, um, as you're thinking about the ONC's efforts to support and enable um, the, the, the kinds of things we need to do to address the, the issues of, of healthcare disparities and health equity. Um, how, how do you approach that? And what, what are your thoughts on what not only ONC, but more broadly, we as a health IT community can and should be focused on to address that important issue? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, um, obviously it's a, it's a priority area of this administration. I mean, it should be a priority area of our society. Um, and, uh, and, and fortunately, this administration is now making it, you know, a, a, you know, a front and center priority. Um, and, you know, a, a couple of thoughts there. One is, um, you know, I think if you look at, you know, sort of everything that we're starting to do now, um, all of it is with an eye toward um, equity disparity, disparity consideration by design. So not as an afterthought, not as a, oh yeah, we have to check the box on, you know, social terms of health or whatever it is as, you know, sort of a attachment A or attachment C or attachment Z, you know, to whatever it is we're doing. It's more about, no, it's a fundamental design criterion as we think about policy, as we think about infrastructure, as we think about, you know, sort of technical capabilities that we want to be able to roll out. 
And you're starting to see that, I think, in all of the rethinking about, you know, the way public health data systems work, um, the way interoperability should work, um, even in the areas that, you know, that we've been um, working on, like vaccine credentials, for example. Um, and how do we, how should the federal government approach this emerging new type of, you know, sort of techno technological capability that's gonna, that could be vitally important to people's being able to return to normalcy? How do we ensure that there is an ecosystem that is equitable to all and available to all? and addresses all of the issues of, you know, um, that people have because of their circumstance that, you know, that they may not be able to easily download something on a smartphone and then present it wherever they want to go. Um, and that's all, you know, sort of in the way of policy and the way we think about that saying that is a fundamental design criterion. It's a fundamental requirement of the way we're going to think about it. Again, it's not an afterthought like, well, let's get the easy stuff done and then we'll deal with the hard stuff as, you know, like right. an edge case. It's like, no, 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 that's a, that's a central case. It's not an edge case. Um, so that's, you know, that's one part of it, I think. And then as you start to, you know, to dig down into that, um, you, you know, I think that, you know, a big part of it is helping to illuminate where are the issues in a very, very complex value chain. And I think if you, you just start to look at, you know, from the outside, for an outside observer, um, I'm sure you have these conversations, you know, in your outside of professional uh, conversation, and I certainly do too all the time. It's like, what's the big deal? Just collect more of that data and then send it. And, you know, why are we not doing that, right? And as we know, it's an unbelievably complex value chain. It's, it all starts with what are the, you know, what are the data that you're looking for? Is it structured? Can you get the workflows in place so that front end staff can do the jobs that they have to do and ask those questions and not have patient hesitancy of responding to any of those things? I mean, that's the first thing, right? And then you start to go through that complex chain of how that data actually flows and, you know, sort of the fragmentation of our industry, where as we know, you know, we start to look at that data and as HHS Protect and, you know, all of these systems start to aggregate it and are able to look at it in, in ways that they weren't able to do before, you know, start to ask questions of, well, wait a minute, how come I can't cut lab data by race, ethnicity, language? Like, well, because when you go to a lab, they don't ask you those questions, <laughs> right? I mean, when I went to Quest, I mean, yeah. you know, I didn't expect Quest to ask me those questions. They're not going to ask me those questions. They're just going to, you know, do the lab. That data is collected elsewhere. Well, we have no place except for HIEs, for example, where that data can be brought together. So you, it starts to, you know, really, you have to really unpack the business model all the way through end to end, understand the fragmentation, and then understand how you attack each of those pieces, um, to, you know, to be able to do that. And I think that's one of the things that I'd like to, you know, sort of focus on um, with ONC and to help other agencies understand the business practices that are underlying a lot of this that contribute to this. And so, you know, one of the things, for example, as we think about lab standards and LOINC, um, you know, we, we ONC are, um, you know, um, are, are supporting LOINC in lots of different ways, and we're really happy to. I mean, this is, you know, improving standards and, and, and helping to support standards bodies is really important part of the work. But one of the things that, you know, has just struck me from being in the market for 20 years is just that, well, some of it is about how do we have better standards, but, all the way at the other end of the chain is how do those standards get enforced? How, how do we actually monitor adherence to those standards? And right. it's very different for different types of transactions. And labs is a particular interest of mine because, well, A, because, you know, that's where I first learned all this stuff from mm -hmm. McDonald way back when. Um, <laughs> and so I had a bias toward thinking that, oh, labs are the most important thing in the world. Um, and, uh, but also recognizing that, you know, that as we think about you know, some of the other types of transactions, things like prescriptions, right? You have sure scripts that plays a role. It's, you know, in some ways, you know, it, it has, there's, there's a market power that's, you know, that's there that we could argue about whether that's a good or a bad thing. But one of the good things about it is that they play the role in standardizing a certain type of transactions, right? So they will actually tell you, nope, you know, rejected. <laughs> um, yeah, and then you ask yourself, well, in the lab world, who plays that role? And the answer is no one. Literally no one. So yeah. when a hospital delivers a lab to an ambulatory practice with a custom code, who's, who's in that path to say, right. time out, you're not allowed to do that. You need to fix that. Literally no one. Um, right. And I think that's, I think we need to think really hard as we think about how do we get better lab interoperability about that problem. That if we don't have monitoring enforcement, you can do the best most usable standards at the beginning of that pipe as you know, in the world, but right. you're still gonna get an incredible mess on this end because you have to make people care about it. That's a, that's a, a great note to end on. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's almost uh, 
as you, as you know, kind of in private circles, almost a joke, right? And they, well, the good thing about standards is if you don't like that one, there's plenty more to choose from. <laughs> it's not really a standard if you're not actually standardizing. Right. So, um, well, Mickey, thank you so much. Uh, this has been such a fantastic discussion. And um, again, thank you for your service to the country and for all the work that you're leading now uh, to your incredible team. I wish you guys the best of luck. We're counting on you. Uh, and uh, just know that that we um, here at, at Regan Street, at Loink, and and across our health IT community are not only cheering for you, but we're here to we're here to assist however you need us, and uh, and we're looking forward to great things ahead. So, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, mean, I, I have such a debt of gratitude to you know to Regan Street and to all the great folks there, as well as to the Loink community. Um, and, uh, and and really look forward to working with you know with all of you in a, in a really deep way to help move this forward. So thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank, this is Marjorie and thank you, Dr. Tripathi and Dr. Mb, for that very thoughtful, engaging discussion. You've given us some, a lot of good things to take with us and think about. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.